Good morning, viewers and listeners. We uh, are excited to be with you today. Today, it looks as if it's going to be Dr. Alexander and myself, but do not be fooled. The topic that we have today is of just humongous, humongous uh, weight and importance today. Uh, and I will not belabor the point. We will be very judicious with our time today. We're going to get right into it. Doc, if you could dive uh, directly into our main topic today. Absolutely. Good morning, people. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing the proceedings of the National Immigration Convention of Colored People held at Cleveland, Ohio on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, the 24th, 25th, and 26th of August. 1854. And uh, in, in addition to the content, I, I, I want people to, to just grasp those dates. <laughs> August 24th, 25th, and 26th. Today is the 26th, I believe. God doesn't make any mistakes. Right. And and, and so, you know, we, we are talking about an event that lines up with our very day, and you know that 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 we could be we we could, we're actually celebrating an anniversary to the date, and uh, I think the other thing to be mindful of, and you will see um, how critical the information is, and how timeless the inner information is. Now. Again, we're going to be talking about this particular convention, but also important for us to know is that the, the color convention movement started in 1830. And these, these were conventions that were being convened by the free black folks, the free black people in the United States from 1830 I think the last convention may have been in like 1917, something like that. But uh, don't fret because all of these conventions are recorded. And so there's a website, www.coloredconventions.com. And it's called the Color Convention Project. And you can go there and you can find all of the colored conventions from 1830, again, until I think the last one was like uh, 1917. But as I said, these are knowable answers. And so all you gotta do is go to the site and click on and see the menu. And, you know, there are brochures, uh, meeting details. They usually, they will usually have a copy of the pamphlets that were either Sometimes they have the copy of the, the, the invitations and then, but, but in most cases, the overwhelming majority of the cases, they have, they have the pamphlet and they have the meeting minutes. And what is important about the meeting minutes uh, are the resolutions and the attendees, the representatives, the, the delegates. And there are so, there's just so much history in here. And, and so, you, you'll you'll see, like even in this one that we're going to talk about today, Frederick Douglass did not attend, but he is mentioned. Uh, but Martin Delaney uh, regularly shows up, and you know just just so many other folks, and it's just appropriate on the anniversary of this date that we have this conversation. And um, and really kind of lay out the, uh, the platform that was established. And as we're going through this, uh, you know, in, in particular with, with with Martin Delaney and and Frederick Douglass, you know, we will we'll touch on why Frederick Douglass was not in attendance at this particular meeting. And so with that, we're going to jump this week. We're going to focus on the the platform of the National Immigration Convention of Colored People. And given the, the title, you, you can probably guess that there is a portion 
at least a portion of this that, that speaks to immigration. But the majority of the platform really just has to do with what is in the best interests of the Black folks who found themselves, you know, captive in what was the United States at that time. What What is good for them, period? What is good for us? What is it that we need to do? And so with that, Attorney Fields, let's let's move to the platform. We'll move to the platform. And I think, you know, uh, as I read the platform for the first time, and thank you so much, once again, your research is impeccable and um, you get into almost being undefeated. Um, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, this this colloquialism, I'm my ancestors' wildest dreams, I'm beginning to, you know, I, 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 I'm wondering if that's correct. Um, <laughs> I, 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 Yes, we have to have that conversation. Too. We have to have that conversation because there are some things that are modern day um, regressive to where they yes. were in 1830. Um, yes. Now, I want to uh, let the audience know that this is long and we are not going to abri uh, uh, abridge this because this is strong. We need to hear it and um, we need to opine on it. This needs to soak in. So having said that, this is from the uh, convention that was spoken of, and this is a declaration of sentiments of the Cleveland Convention. <clears throat> and it begins, whereas for years, the colored people of the United States have been looking, hoping, and waiting in expectation of realizing the blessings of civil liberty. And whereas during this long, tedious, and anxious period, they have been depending upon their white fellow countrymen to effect for them the, this desirable end, but instead of which they have met with disappointment, discouragement, and degradation, and whereas no people can ever attain the elevated position of freemen who are totally or partially ignorant of the constituent element of political liberty, and whereas in the multitude of conventions heretofore held by our fathers and contemporary, co-temporaries among the colored people of the United States, no such principles as a basis have been, have ever been adduced or demonstrated to us as a guide for action. And whereas no people can maintain their freedom without an interested motive and a union of sentiment as a rule of action and nucleus to hold them together. And whereas all of the conventions heretofore held by the whites in this country of whatever political pretensions, whether Democrat, Whig, or free democracy, all have thrown themselves upon the declaration to sustain the constitution as our forefathers understood it and the union as they formed it, all of which plainly and boldly imply unrestricted liberty to the whites and the right to hold the blacks in slavery and degradation. Therefore, as Declaration of Sentiments, anti-platform of this convention, be it resolved that we acknowledge the natural equality of the human race, that man is by nature free and cannot be enslaved except by injustice and oppression, that the right to breathe the air and use the soil on which the creator has placed us is co-inherent with the birth of man, the co-evolve with the existence, consequently, Whatever interferes with this sacred inheritance is the jointly ally of slavery and at war against the just decree of heaven. Hence, men cannot be independent without possessing the land on which he resides. That whatever interferes with the natural rights of man should meet from him with adequate resistance. That under no circumstances, let the consequences be as they may, will we ever submit to enslavement that the power that attempts it emanate from whatever source it will, that no people can have political liberty without the sovereign right to exercise a free man's will, that no individual is politically free who is deprived of the right of self-representation, that to be a free man necessarily implies the right to be elected of the elective franchise, that the privilege of voting does not necessarily imply an exercise of the elective franchise since a vote may be given while the franchise is denied, 
to the individual who gives the vote that the elective franchise necessarily implies eligibility to every position attainable, the indisputable right of being chosen or elected as the representative of another, and otherwise then this term is the sheerest imposition and delusion that a people who are liable under any pretext or circumstances, whatever, to enslavement by the laws of a country cannot be free in that country because the right of a free man necessarily are sacred and inviolable that as men and equal, we demand every political right, privilege and position to which the whites are eligible in the United States. And we will entertain and, and we will either attain to these or accept of nothing that as colored people in whatever part of the country we may be located, we will accept of no political rights nor privileges, but such as shall be impartial in their provisions, nor will we acknowledge these except extended alike to each and every colored person in such state or territory that the political distinctions in many of the states made by the whites and accepted of by the colored people comprise in many instances our greatest social curses and tend more than anything else to divide our interests and make us indifferent to each other's welfare, that we pledge our integrity to use all honorable means to unite us as one people on this continent, that we have no confidence in any political party nor a politician, by whatever name they may be styled or whatever their pretensions, who acknowledges the right of man to hold property in his fellow man. Whether this right be admitted as a necessary part of the national compact, the provisions of the Missouri Compromise, the detestably insulting and degrading Fugitive Slave Act, or the more recent contem contemptible Nebraska-Kansas bill that the act of Congress of 1850, known as the Fugitive Bill, we declare to be a general law tending to the virtual enslavement of every colored person in the United States and consequently we abhor its existence, dispute its authority, refuse submission to its provisions and hold it in a state of the most contemptuous abrogation that as a people, we will never be satisfied nor contended until we occupy a position where we are acknowledged a necessary constituent in the ruling element of the country in which we live, that no oppressed people have ever obtained their rights by voluntary acts of generosity on the part of their oppressors, that it is futile hope on our part to expect such results through the agency of moral goodness on the part of our white American oppressors that all great achievements by the Anglo-Saxon race have been accomplished through the agency of self-interest, that the liberty of a people is always insecure who have not absolute control of their own political destiny, that if we desire liberty, it can only be obtained at the price which others have paid for it, that we're willing to pay that price let the cost be what it may, that according to the present social system of civilized society, the equality of persons is only recognized by their equality of attainments as with individuals, so is it with classes and communities. Therefore, we impress on the colored races throughout this continent of the world, the necessity of having their children and themselves properly qualified in every respectable vocation pertaining to the industrial and wealth accumulating occupations of arts, science, trades and professions of agriculture, commerce and manufacturers, so as to equal and position the leading characters of a nations of the earth without which we cannot at best but occupy a position of subservancy that the potency and respectability of a nation or people depends entirely upon the positions of their women. women. Therefore, it is essential to our elevation that the female portion of our children be instructed in all the arts and sciences pertaining to the highest civilization, that we will forever 
this countenance all invidious distinctions among us that no people as such can ever attain to greatness who lose their identity as they must rise entirely upon their own native merit merits that we shall ever cherish our identity of origin and race as preferable in our estimation to any other people that the relative terms Negro, African, Black, colored, and mulatto, when applied to us, shall ever be held with the same respect and pride and synonymous with the terms Caucasian, White, Anglo-Saxon, and European, when applied to the cla that class of people. That as a people determined to be free, we individually pledge ourselves to support and sustain on all occasions by every justifiable effort, as far as possible, the declaration set forth in this bill of sentiments. Note to section nine, <laughs> suffrage and franchise are essentially dissimilar. Suffrage implying the mere privilege or permission to give a vote, while franchise implies the right or acknowledged authority of eligibility, attainment, or in plainer language still, the right of being elevated to every position within the gift of the sovereign people. This is the elective franchise, while voting is a mere permission, a thing suffered to be done. In France, Louis Napoleon permitted every man to vote for him, but none dared vote for any other person. Thus, those who elevated him to the presidency could not themselves be so elevated. Here was an exercise of suffrage without the elective franchise. Louis Napoleon himself, out of the 40 millions of France, being the only person at the time who possessed the elective franchise, because the only person who could be elevated by election to position, all others who were elevated attaining their position by his appointment. And that is it. So brother. And at that, um, uh, I mean, first of all, this notion that we're coming up with something new needs to be debunked. Doc, I'll you. hand it over to you. And 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 then that's exactly where we'll start. Um, I had a brother say, so so let's take this situation in Memphis, or is that where where was it? Mobile, Mobile, uh, Alabama. Yeah, yeah Montgomery. Montgomery, where, where, where the guy had, they had the river, riverboat yeah, thing? Yeah, I believe it was Montgomery. So this Alabama thing, um, you know, just the other day, you know, I, I find myself present for one of those conversations. And, and one of the brothers said, you know, what these white folks need to know, we ain't our grandparents. <laughs> That's terrible. And, and I just, I, I, I hate that phrase. I hate any. I hate anything. I, I've always hated it, but even more so <laughs> in response to this situation, because this situation has taken on this heightened. Th this situation has grown to be the model of our self-defense, and all that really happened was these jokers had a fight with some scoundrels at a dock, mm -hmm. right? Right. And so the elevation of the event to some historic status, coupled with some of the, the things that are implicit in it, which cause it to be elevated to such, speaks to our lack of knowledge of our history and appreciation for the fights that have occurred, that are still occurring, that have allowed us to be here for that event even to have happened. Right, right. right. And so what is clear is that we still don't get it. We think that we are fighting against those people on the dock. Those people on the dock are just some random people that you might encounter, right? Those people on the dock are probably people that most of us don't really have to worry about encountering, <laughs> you know, we, we just, 
that's not who they are. They don't impact our day. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying that as, you know, I'm not degrading that their infringement on their brother's life. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the significance that we have placed on that. And it speaks to the fact that we still don't understand that we are being subjugated and the and therefore are in resistance against the number one power in the United in, in the world. Not the United States. The United States is that. The United States is the number one political power in the world. And that is the entity at which we are engaged in this day-to-day -day struggle, this day-to-day -day resistance, you know, of, of United States hegemony and, and you know, subjugation. And, you know, we are literally behind enemy lines. And how do I know this? Because that is exactly what they were meeting about on, on August 24th, 25th, and 26th of 1854. And that's exactly what this platform speaks to. And as we walk back through this platform, we will see that that platform is as pertinent today as it was before, which also speaks to your initial, you know, your, your initial response and questioning, are we really, you know, what they imagine? Because it's clear when you read this platform that somebody slept at the wheel. You know, Doc, this disjointed history we have, um, we tend to believe that we are doing something groundbreaking. Um, I can remember when we, when we were at Morehouse, one of the sternest admonitions Professor um, Cornwell gave in our history class was to a gentleman that tried to characterize us as complicit or uh, uh, um, acquiescent in, in, in docile, like in slavery. And I never will forget not only just the look of disdain, but the level of intensity that this normally meek professor had when he stated that there were well over a thousand insurrections from Africans. Um, you know, that you will never more than likely read about. So this notion, you know, so, so, you know, essentially you have young man, just put your whole ignorant brain on display. And now the whole class has got to go and do a research project. Um, and it is from that backdrop oftentimes that we, it, we're not even, we're not even doing family history. No. Because if you, if you would have done family history, you would have known that more than likely the reason why your family's not in the South anymore is because they left there because they were exercising something on nonviolent <laughs> in, in many cases. So, um, I mean, we've just, I mean, we're just detached, man. I, I could, I could not care less about this book ban, but, um, as, 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 um, Dr. Carr says, the shadow book ban is the one that I'm concerned about. You have the ability to read a book and you won't pick it up. And you won't pick up a book. We got That's all of this information available to us and we're arguing about what the enemy will willfully teach us, which is what the, it's all. So, so, and that's why we're gonna, they tell you, it's not happening. We're not free if our every, you know, every form of sustenance is predicated on the goodwill of white folks. Come on, man. Let's get, let's go back to it. Let's get into it. And, and so, one to 10, that's what's being established in one to 10. You know, fundamentally, what, what is human? What, what is it to be and and an acknowledge human? And I apologize Ooh. for not acknowledging each paragraph as I read them. I, I was down to, I was so into it by the time I got 24, I was like, I should have, I should have identified numerically these paragraphs, but go ahead. Not a problem. Yeah. Number one, resolve that we acknowledge the natural equality of the human race. Two, that man be by nature free and cannot be 
enslaved except by injustice and oppression. And so these two are pivotal. They're, they're, they're pivotal in terms of how we interpret our history, right? Um, we, we think a lot of different things about, about slavery, but there is, there's, there's only certain conversations in which you'll hear people say injustice or unjust and oppression. Because we, we don't really have a good sense of the gravity of the moment and all of the things that had to occur in order for us to end up here. You know, this, this confusion about what occurred on the West Coast of Africa and, you know, in, in some of the central states in Africa and the complicity of certain, uh, of, of the leadership of certain kingdoms to be involved in the trade, all of which has to be discussed at some point, but it has to be discussed so that we can understand what exactly happened and how we got here. And we can only do that if we choose to engage the content. But what we have to know is that it makes no sense for us not to understand what was going on when we have access to information. <laughs> we, the, they are contemplating this in the most hostile of times. Right. The other thing that we don't have a full appreciation for is that the lives of the free people in the antebellum South were not, you know, or antebellum America, let, let me say, were these were not pleasant times. These because they were free did not mean that they because they were not enslaved, let me say, does not mean that they were free. They were still subjugated, and that is a part of what, that is why it is even necessary <laughs> for them to start the platform laying out humanity. It is, it's, and and how much has really changed, Doc? How much has really changed? How much has really changed? There's, you know, the, the, and the fact that these free Black folks dealt with subserviency the way they did. And, and they had the foresight to identify the fact that subserviency was really um, a, a, a transition from, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, chattel slavery to um, another form of oppression. Second class citizens. And what'd you say, Doc? Second class citizenship. Second class citizenship that we refuse to deal with right now. Okay. And, and three, the right to breathe the air and use the soil on which the, crea the creator has placed us is co-inherent with the birth of man and co with his existence. Consequently, whatever interferes with this sacred inheritance is the joint ally of slavery and at war against the just decree of heaven. Hence, man cannot be independent without possessing the land on which he resides. That mm -hmm. whatever interferes with the natural rights of man should meet from him with adequate resistance. That under no circumstances, let the consequences be as they may, will we ever submit to enslavement. Let the power that attempts it emanate from whatever source it will. And so we're not grasping the gravity of this situation. This is the platform in 1854. So folks would be like, well, yeah, I mean, you had, you know, I mean, you see why he would say it then, because, you know, slave and slave, but he's not simply talking about enslavement. That's not what they, that is not what they were convening about. No, he was talking about full body freedom. Yes. And we still do not have it. And and if we're paying attention, they are attempting to make this these uh youngsters totally 
subservient. There is no, there, there's a reason why we can't find bus drivers and we sh are shutting schools down. Um, the uh, 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 Betty DeVos and those folks, when she was Secretary of State, had uh, made it very, very clear that they wanted to eliminate public education. And they have stated in no uncertain terms, some of the things we're going to have to do are going to be ugly. And if you can't get your child to school <laughs> and you're not teaching them at home, what's going on? So they're trying to create a subservient class and maintain one. And many of us are complicit. We are. And so, you know, whether or not you personally want to send your son or daughter to a public or private, you know, certainly that is, you know, that that's that's within your wheelhouse. You you get to make that decision, but we cannot afford to be indifferent to public education. Nice. We pay taxes, you know, so that's that's the main reason right there. Right. You're, you're, you're paying taxes to support public education. So you should be engaged in the fight on behalf of those who rely on public education. Because A, it is, you know, it is it's your fiduciary responsibility, right? That you is <laughs> we don't want to, we don't want to take a fiduciary responsibility. I yeah. mean and, and then and then two, you know, because of that, you should be, you know, be, because your because your resources are being allocated in that direction. You should then have an interest in what is occurring in that space with your resources. So you should then, that should mean or equate to that you have a care about the welfare of the folks who are there to receive that service. And then as this thing plays out, because we make up the majority of public education, this has to be an agenda item for it. Has to be. Once again, for those that are just tuning in, we are reading excerpts from the proceedings of the National Immigration Convention of Colored People held at Cleveland, Ohio, on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, the 24th, 25th, and 26th of August in 1854. Um, Doc, uh, let's go to the next paragraph. Next <laughs> if you Number will. six, that no people can have political liberty without the sovereign right to exercise a freeman's will. Seven, that no individual is politically free who is deprived of the right of self-representation. Number eight, that to be a freeman necessarily implies the right of the elective franchise. Number nine, you want to stop at that one? Let's, let's go, let's ten? stop, let's stop and talk right there. All right. That's one, that is one colloquialism that I think um, we have right this when we state disfranchisement, but I don't think we understand what it means. Absolutely, I, I was thinking the exact same thing. We talk about the franchise because we've so the way we talk about the franchise today hmm. is what he is talking about voting. Exactly, and so let's give an example of that. When you talk about gerrymandering. Gerrymandering, when it is done to maximize the votes for the party in power and to minimize and water down the votes for the party not in power. So we, they, you know, what is done is maps are shaped in a fashion to waste as many votes as possible for local representation and for congressional representation uh, as possible for the party not in power. So in other words, if I have, we'll say, we'll say we'll take a square block of 20 different blocks, okay? And of that square block, we'll say 16 of those individuals, you know, is a black block, and we'll say four of them is a white block. What is done in a situation like that? is all of the black votes are comprised in an area where they will have a supermajority <laughs> that's unnecessary 
for their candidate and no effect whatsoever for any potential white candidate. And so what you produce are wasted votes. And that wasted vote prevents you from exercising yourself to self-governance. And that's what is being spoken about here. So how do we know? This is how we know. Number nine, that the privilege of voting does not necessarily imply an exercise of the elective franchise. Since a vote may be given while the franchise is denied to the individual who gives the vote. Is, is that not what gerrymandering creates? It's exactly what it creates. And I know firsthand because I litigated these cases and guess where I was when we litigated these cases, Doc? Hmm. Ohio. Ohio. We had cases where there was a gentleman that um, worked for the NAACP that um, in, in Dayton that the uh, Republicans had hired to put together these gerrymandering maps. Um, and you know, we had to depose this guy and have those maps set aside. Um, you know, now he his paid position, let me say his voluntary position was with the NAACP. Um, but they leveraged that into attempting to whitewash what he was doing. But, you know, it's just, it's it's so just uh, overwhelmingly poignant, these points that are that were made back then and how they... Yeah, or, or, or cascading uh, light on the situation we're in right now. Would not the electoral college and the electors also be a manifestation of how, you know, though we have a right to vote, which uh, we won't necessarily discuss in depth any further than these next two today, but in our, one of our next conversations, we're actually going to speak to um, in in a, in a future show. We're actually going to speak to um, uh, Martin Delaney's his his lecture, you know, on this date, um, and he speaks he he speaks to citizenship more specifically in that, and um, but what we see here again. In, in, in very, you know, fundamental terms is a conversation about what makes you a citizen, wherever it is you show up. A, you are a human. B, you have a right to the resources, <laughs> including the air. Why is the air important? Because we can't breathe. I mean, the, the, <laughs> we, we have to embrace this conceptually, right? Right now, yes, and, and so many of us think that this comes from you know this current struggle. You can find, you can find, you know, uh, references to us being able to breathe throughout our struggle. You know, similarly, these conversations about being wake and woke and. You can find this stuff throughout our struggle, but you can only find them, you know, if you ain't involved and engaged in that shadow bank. You know, we have to engage the content. Number 10 makes this pretty, pretty, pretty simple in terms of what you're laying out, brother. Number 10, that the elective franchise necessarily implies eligibility to every position attainable the indisputable right of being chosen or elected as representative of another and otherwise and otherwise than this the term is the sheerest imposition and delusion and so again that speaks to so so if gen gerrymandering is occurring if 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 we have if we have these electors who despite your intent with your vote you know, disregard legally, disregard your intent, your, your intent, then you're not exercising the franchise. You are simply 
voted. And many of us don't know this is what's happening. And many of us aren't even looking for, you know, we're not even contemplating it in that regard. And part of the reason why we're not strategically contemplating it in that regard is that along the way, we have lost this, right? And for reasons that will also become evident as we read the steps of this platform, you know, we have to accept our relative responsibility. But back to your initial critique, we are not showing up how our ancestors envisioned. We are not showing up as they wildest dream. I, I think that point that you just made needs to be highlighted because what you just said was we have people that we voted for and put in office that are disenfranchising us. Indeed. And that is a, that is a, uh, a stark um, revelation. Uh, and, you know, once again, that is, you know, something that, you know, we need to start there. <laughs> if we started there and then worked around our way, you know, worked around uh, to, towards gerrymandering and so forth, I think we would be, or actually fighting those fights as we've all constantly stated, we got to fight those fights on, the, you know, on those different fronts at the same time. But we have got to start, uh, stop our elected officials from disenfranchising us first. Absolutely which requires that we understand the difference between voting and the franchise, right? The platform hasn't changed, right? And so again, so the other thing that you will hear, you know, in random conversations, we need a platform. We need something that we can come around, we can, we can coalesce around. The platform has existed for hundreds of years. It ain't never changed. The title, the title of this, uh, the, these excerpts that we're reading from, it's called the platform. It, this platform has the platform. It has platform everything. Has, changed. has everything. We want air, which is health. We want, uh, we want our, our babies, now our our boys and girls educated. It, our it, boys it, and girls. Our boys in eighteen fifty four. In eighteen fifty four. And what do we want them employed in? Everything. We want them to go to school and learn everything. We're not saying. This predates all of this conversation. And so, so the other thing that's important about going back and reading these, you know, uh, th these excerpts, the, well, actually, they ain't even excerpts. So you go back and you can read the full program the, and minutes, attendance, everything from each of these meetings dating back to 1830. You see the things that were being contemplated. This conversation is about this, this, con this convention was convened to discuss uh, immigration, right? So 1830, 1833, maybe 1830, uh, 1836, 35 and 36, one of the conversations that were being had, or one of the conversations that was being had over the course of that time was, you know, um, repatriation. And so you had these colonization uh, organizations. And so the free people were trying to decide, are these colonization people friend or foe? Because people were having to make real decisions. Free people were having to make real decisions. You had organizations, private organizations that were uh, offering to freedmen the opportunity to go back to Africa to Liberia, Liberia, typically, to go back. And I think there were some, some situations with Sierra Leone. And so people were making decisions about, you know, this is all I've ever known, or I still got people enslaved, right? And then, and then you had a group of folks who had already really kind of detached themselves from Africa for various reasons, some of which are sound, some said, we built this place, we got a right to this place, we should stay here and fight, right? Some said, I ain't really African, right? But one of the things that came out of that conversation was 
color. Right? So you had a group of people propose, and we'll go back to this one at some point, and maybe we'll go back to this, we'll go back to some of those conferences or those conventions based on their dates. Maybe we'll do that. And so we'll we'll kind of go, we'll get to them maybe organically unless we find that there's something in particular that we need to get to. But in the course of that conversation, folks started, started uh, wise to, instead of refer to ourselves as African, to refer to ourselves as colored so as to neutralize you know, the threat for folks who had other than noble intentions in terms of the recolonization to say that, you know, we're no longer identifying as African, we're colored, we're here. You know, when I initially read that, I thought it was wrong. <laughs> I still think it's wrong today, but I could see where it comes from, right? But my point is that we've been, as long as we've been here, we've been contemplating our identity. This is not a function of the 60s. This is not a function of the 70s. And but you won't know that if you don't embrace the information. Go ahead, brother. No, brother. I mean, I don't, I really don't want to interrupt you, but uh be, but it speaks to the identity piece in the platform. Mm -hmm. It speaks to it very, very well. No man and and, and the thing that I love most about it, it identified all of the identities that, that were associated with us in the platform. I don't care if you're mulatto, you're black, I, I don't care what you call yourselves. We are, uh, yeah, we are who we are against any of those others, <laughs> you know, white, European, whatever you want. But we will not take a subservient uh, uh, posture with, against any of them. So, and, and can't you see that? This platform, I mean, without even reading the 23 previous conventions, can't you see by virtue of what ends up in this platform, what they talked about? You can not only see it, but what also is, is, is just assumed is that um, these individuals have a literacy rate that is not common today. Um, in addition to that, what were their original languages? Yes. What were their original languages? They had to come over here and learn this. There's not a, I mean, what, you know, what brilliance did they have not, not outside of their uh, uh, ability to see into the future, their foresight, um, but the the actual literal brilliance that they had, and 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 the work that they did in order to get it, you know. So, you know, so so we know Martin Delaney is there. You know, there are references to Frederick Douglass. There are re references to Henry Highland Garnett, right? Um. Henry Highland Garnett is somebody we're going to need to drill down on, you know, at another time uh, because he is a model. Like if you read, so one, one of the books that uh, Carter G. Whitson wrote, well, I think it's um, the educate, the education of the Negro 18 it's 18 something through it's, it might be 16, it might be 1619 to 1863, something like it might. That might be the title, you know, something like that. I, I, I you know, I'll, I'll get the, I'll get the title. Maybe I'll get it before we get off. But anyway, if you read that book, man, Henry Highland Garnett shows up wherever their school. That brother shows up. Now he ain't got no car. He ain't got no. He ain't got, <laughs> this, this brother is so thirsty for learning. Right, you know, um, if, if you read if you read about Martin Delaney, Martin Delaney's parents, he 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 was born into a a a a a um, a um, mixed family of such. Right, his mom was born free. Right, so his mom was free, 
his dad was enslaved. So that's what I mean when I say a mixed. <laughs> and so she she got a ticket for educating her children. Right. And so I forget where where they were at this point, but she takes the kids and I think she moves to Pennsylvania. And then his father eventually is able to buy, you know, purchase his freedom and then he joins them. Right. But these were, you know, these were things that people were having to do. Right. So if you have a problem, yeah, let's say, you know, so so other problem with this conversation we're having right now, we're having we're having this conversation as if this is a problem in Florida. This is a problem in the United States. All it is the census stuff. And so you have people pivoting to, into Florida and the, when the very thing is happening in the state in which they live. What 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 it sound like for people in Missouri to be talking about Florida when it, when it's happening in Missouri and you told yourself you woke because you paying attention to Florida. Meanwhile, they dumbing down your kids in Missouri. And you're not right? reading to them. And right. And you're not you're not reading to yourself. You're not reading for you or your kids. Right. And so that, that becomes a whole thing. And that's 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 why it's kind of laughable when we have some of these conversations about the concerns that we have for our children, when in reality, we're not doing what we need to do for ourselves in order to buttress our children from the effects of the onslaught. Right. We are the shadow band. Right. Right. So that's what brother said. Right. And so. Um, I see. And, yes. And so. If we are not engaging the information and we're not making good use of the information, we're not directing our children to the information, then there's no way for our children really to benefit. And, and, and uh, D. Mike Jones has said that over and over again, particularly with regard to St. Louis, the school board at the local level, you get the, you you have major influence on the curriculum. If you don't, if you don't move in that direction, then it is of no use. And, and so you can't sit back and blame the state and the feds for your own inactivity. If you are breastfeeding a child, the child is going to get what you eat. So, I mean, if you are putting toxins in yourself, guess what you're going to give your baby? If you're not getting the nutrients, what you going to, you know, if you're not getting the proper nutrients, what you going to give your baby? And so it starts with us, but we have got to be very, very intentional about fortifying, the, you know, our babies. And, and I think we ought to just kind of sit here in this space and kind of deal with these 10 as, you know, it's taking us our time to get through, you know, to get through the 10. So we're going to, this is going to be our content for a couple of weeks. That's where it needs and, and so again, we have to 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 grasp what it means, you know, what are the implications of our humanity? What are the what are the implications of our God given rights? What are what are the implications for uh, our citizenship rights and our uh, access to the ballot and our exercise of the franchise. That's it. What are the implications with respect to our franchise? If we if we operated from that from that um, basis right there. I think everything else would, with the definition that our ancestors have given us, if yes. we use the proper definition of franchise, I think we would settle all of our problems. Our, our ancestors imagined, you know, since that's what we want to say, our ancestors imagined that we would be working from this. Right? This, yes, is, this, this is why they established it. That's this is the platform. That's correct. Right. And so I, I think we're missing. I think we are missing the mark. We're getting there, though. I mean, by you bringing this to the forefront, 
I mean, it, the right time is always the right time. This is the right time. This is the right time. So we are going to build here. Uh, and, you know, it's a perfect, you know, perfect piece because I'm sure when we go back further to the other. Yeah, you know, we'll see how this came. We'll see how this came and we can move forward. But I think we're in a, to be honest with you, I, what this has done um along with a number of other things i got a book last uh a couple of weeks ago that um yeah, uh, it's titled that nonviolent stuff will get you killed added another brick into the wall of you know some of the philosophies that i've already had and and that is no slight against martin luther king because that is my guy um but all of these things are coming around i mean so there should be really there's no question on, uh, in my opinion, on what we should be doing. And this specific um, piece that you have, I think is a fundamental piece that a number of people that are more than likely listening have been looking for to justify the way that they felt. Because, I mean, <clears throat> I can remember Hillary Clinton making a statement. Um, uh, and I went on a, you know, campaign against um, uh, about the fact that, you know, in recent times, Black folks were just now enjoying the want or thirst for uh, liberty and so forth. And I went back as far as I could find things and, and came forward uh, on how our fight for liberty and justice and so forth started the minute the first Black person hit the shore, the first enslaved Black person, because they were Black people here already. Um, that's a whole nother conversation. Um, the first enslaved person hit the shores of the United States. Um, but this is a fundamental aspect of that. And this is a cornerstone that we need to spend a great deal of time with. And we thank you for bringing this to the forefront, Doc. And, and hopefully as we, as we, you know, kind of wrestle with, 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 with this content is that we will see and have a, and, and gain a better understanding of, you know, I'm not saying that we haven't seen, you know, a progression. I'm not saying that. I am saying that we err if we believe that the progression is along the lines of our intentional behavior with regard to our liberty. That, that progression looks like this. It's, it's not the other way around. It's not that right now we the freest we ever been. That's, that's you know, so we think that free thought starts with us and goes backwards and, and, and our ancestors just didn't do it. That's not, that's not what happened. That is not what happened. It, it, the, it, it, the, 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 the resistance that we have in mind comes from them. It's not, it, it was not missed, right? You know, and there's not, I, 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 and if you think that you're starting over with every generation, you already lost. And that is our problem because what happens is, I guarantee you, I guarantee you. Well, I'm, I'm gonna just use, I'm gonna use my my regular metaphor, Colin Kaepernick. A thousand people, a thousand black men were getting shot, <laughs> unarmed. Black men were getting shot by the police before Colin, Ka Colin Kaepernick, during Colin Kaepernick, and since Colin Kaepernick, right? And the next time that it happens, which is probably in the next three minutes, <laughs> somebody's going to say, you know, when this start? You know, when the police start? I mean, it's inevitable, right? And this is the nature of our existence. So the issue ain't when is it going, when is, you know, when it has all, this is standard. This is what it means to be in this space, right? But if we don't, you know, if we don't embrace information, it's very hard for us to know. And so why do I bring up Colin Kaepernick? Because that whole thing was an example of our misdirected efforts. The reason why Colin Kaepernick came to prominence in that space is because he was having a demonstration and a protest about the shooting 
of unarmed black men in general and the police brutality met out by the San Francisco police in particular. That's what this was, right? He didn't do anything of his own accord necessarily to draw attention to his protests other than not get up, right? An ex-Marine encouraged him to kneel in respect to the flag. So, so that's how all of this happens. Colin Kaepernick gave a million dollars to uh to the to the local police to facilitate them initiating a training program to re-educate their police, and the San Francisco 49ers matched that money. Right? That's how all this thing starts. Then the right-wing media gets involved, and this becomes about Colin Kaepernick. This was not about Colin Kaepernick. This was about police brutality locally and nationally. What do black folks do? We get involved in solidarity with Colin Kaepernick. That's fine. But if you're gonna get involved in solidarity with Colin Kaepernick, you watching football is the least of what you need to be doing. You know, you not watching football. So this alleged football ban that we that we got involved in as if somehow or another the NFL held the key to the shooting of black officers was foolish. Right. But that's what we did. And how do I know that is foolish? Thousand unarmed black men got shot last year. Colin Kaepernick still ain't in the league and Negroes have resumed their football watching. Right. Negroes was going to bars, was going to bars and eating and drinking during the football game with their backs to the screen as if the, the league wasn't winning that. <laughs> right, right. The league don't care. They just want you to buy. If you're consuming goods, if you're assuming Budweiser on Sunday, the presumption is that is a result of the game. Mm -hmm. The league wins. They don't care if you turn on TV or not. Right. Plus, if you got cable, the league wins. Why? Because about eight dollars, about eight dollars of your cable subscription goes to the NFL in order for ESPN or whoever else to broadcast NFL games. And so, any of that kind of stuff. I mean, but so so what I'm what I'm alluding to is that whole Colin Kaepernick thing is just is is a, a great example about. Uh, our strategic limitations. We don't understand protests. And part of the reason we don't understand protests is that we don't really understand the convention movement and the purpose for convention. Because right now, convention means go kick it. Hmm. We see it all the time. And so we don't really understand how to move the people. Now, you know, oftentimes we believe freedom is associated with a safety valve. Um, you know, not uh, not being oppressed in that moment. Um, you know, we've got uh, as we speak right now, we we are also buttressed against the um, 60th anniversary of the march on Washington, and uh, uh, there are that's today, isn't it? Today, that's today. Um, people are are convening in Washington. It'll be interesting to see what comes out of that. Uh, I know Martin Luther King III is involved in that as well as um, as well as uh, Al Sharpton. Uh, and I mean, it's not to bastardize any work that, you know, any any of those organizations have done. The NAACP, I know we mentioned them earlier, um, but be but uh, rest assured, the NAACP is still doing some great work. Could they do more? I would imagine they would tell you yes, as uh, others would. Um, uh, but, you know, to, your point is 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 a pivotal point. And you are one hundred percent correct. When was the last time we had information coming out of a convention like this? It it don't happen, right? And and so since since today marks yet another milestone. So we have we have we have the culmination of the eighteen fifty four convention, and we're going to continue to you know we'll we'll be on this for a couple of weeks, and we have the commemoration of the march on Washington. I would like to challenge our our listeners, our viewers, and our listeners. Please, if you have not already done so, 
listen to the entire speech. Listen to Dr. King's entire speech. Please. You know, uh, if you have not already done so, I mean, try to get as much of, you know, read read about read about the organization of the march. Read about the relationship of the march to um, to labor, so that you can understand why it was a march for was for for freedom and jobs, you know. And so when we we're talking about you know they came for Martin Luther King when he started talking about the money, the march on Washington was about the money. <laughs> they, come on, he you, went you, to Washington to get his check. He went to, and the check was what? It was marked what? Insufficient, Insufficient funds. funds. And so do yourself and your posterity a favor. Read about the march in its genesis. Read about A. Philip Randolph. You know, read read about uh what's my man, the the, uh, the great, great uh uh, strategist, uh, Barrett Rustin, you know, read about all this stuff. And when you read about Barrett Rustin, for all of you, you know, folks who have issues with the LGBT community, we have been managing these identity complexities forever. This ain't no new thing. You know, so when you read about the march, so that you can get a full and better understanding of the march. Read about how it came to be. Read about its relationship to the Roosevelt administration. Read about, read the entire speech of Dr. King and not just that last, you know, five or 10, that I have a dream piece, which is not his title. That is some co-option that has been given to us. And so, if we are going to commemorate and celebrate these things, we need to, we, we really need, we need to grasp the moment and we need to grasp the, we really need to have a better appreciation for the moment out of which these things come, emerge the intent and the content. And I yield. Well, I mean, in addition to that, it, uh, read the uh, letter from the Birmingham jail. That is, uh, that's a great foundational piece. I have a book um, with a number of his speeches in them. And I was struck by the number of times he was in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and he goes through and, and he was just, he was wise. He was practical. Um, and He's been appropriated. And that's what power structures do. <laughs> power structures. So, so much so that we in St. Louis, we don't consider that we are a place in right. the context of this struggle. Right. Right. We do not. We do not have a, an appreciation for who we are. We don't. So, Doc, I don't think... Um, much need, much more needs to be said today. This is enough to grapple with for a couple of weeks. And so, folks, uh, please, 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 please go to the website. Um, you certainly you can read whatever you want to read, but we're going to be on this convention for at least maybe another two weeks. And so, uh, go to coloredconventions.org. You go to that site. And again, you'll have access to, you know, national conventions and regional conventions that were occurring between 1830 and, um, and again, I think it's 1917. And so there are national conventions, there are regional conventions, and then there are state conventions. And, um, and you really just have to appreciate what it, what it took for freedmen. And when I say freedmen, I mean, free women and men and women. And in some circumstances, and I think this very one was one of them, where we're talking about free free men, women, and children. I think I think this was more of a family affair. And, uh, but to see what people were doing in order to convene and um, deliberate on the well-being of Black folks, not just free Black folks, 
black folks who found themselves captive and subjugated in what we call the United States. That is that I, I don't think that that point can be brought home strong enough um, because yeah, if you uh, if, if you look at that and and its plainness, the question I mean the the inevitable question is what are what are the uh, talented tenth doing right now that parallels that? What are you know? I mean, we're giving out turkeys to you know get psychic income over Thanksgiving. So mm -hmm. you enjoy that, that, is, that is exactly what we do. You, you enjoy your 20 uh, uh, foot ceilings uh, as you watch the Macy's parade. What are mm -hmm. we doing? Mm -hmm. that's, to that's what exactly. extent are we going, you know, to what extent are we uh, putting our necks on the line for the Underground Railroad? We know the way to freedom. What are we doing? We, we go buy a toy at Christmas for the toy drive. Yeah. yeah. We do these things. Wow. Yeah. But I, I'm not sure that. I'm not sure that we are intentionally exercising the franchise. Yeah. Uh, right. You well, got to have skin in the game for that, right? You got to have gotta... skin in the game for that. Well, Doc, um, I can't thank you enough. I hope you all enjoyed this. And if it's the Lord's will, we'll see you real soon. Uh, and we're signing off for the level set. And, and uh, we look forward to engaging with you all very soon.